Hey, Sam, you come up with that intro line? You didn't tell me that was today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Writer's Room with Sam and Jim. This is the show where we bring aspiring writers into our writer's room to help them work on and develop their story. And we're going to do that with Jeff Thurber in just a minute. But first, Sam wants to go off about something. Sam, what you got? So I'm watching one of my favorite shows. And I was in it. I was watching an episode. I was all excited. I had everything positioned just right in my uh, <laughs> TV viewing room, big screen. It's all good, right? And I wasn't sleeping. And I was ready to watch it. And I started watching this episode, and I realized that nothing was happening. That <laughs> the whole in the whole episode, which is unusual for this show. This show is not. Uh, right. This show is a lot of stuff happening all the time. A lot of different storylines. But in this episode, not very much was happening. And I realized. Why, after about 10 or 15 minutes, it's a middle episode. Uh. And the middle episodes, you know, an episode that falls in the middle of the season, those are tough to write. It's that thing. You build the bridge from both ends. You know where you're ending. You know where you're starting. And then you get to that middle. Right. You got to try and make things meet up. And there's another component, though, for TV writers, which is you blew a lot of money on special yeah, effects right. or stunt casting or whatever big action things, if it's an action show. Or, or you're saving or money up for the climax to do those and things. And you're saving money right. up for the climax, right? Because you, yeah. you had to start strong and you have to finish strong. Right. So you have both those pressures. The studio... Who's ever the production executive is is you're having a lot of conversations about what your plans are, um, and in this moment you're like, look, I'm going to save some money. I'm going to save some money by having what we call two handers. So it'll be a lot of scenes with two people in a room talking, and this can be a gift because you can find some emotional story, and you're not you're only on your sets. You're not going to go to new places. It's not even like this isn't a full bottle episode. This right. is just the sort of constrained episode. Yeah. Exactly right. And uh, and bottle episode, for those who don't know, is when you are strictly limited to... Usually one location. Right. Something very... You're really... It's, you're in a bottle. You're in a... It's And I've heard it defined sep differently. Is it your existing sets on your stage or is it... You could be outside, you know, on some stage, some uh, practical set, but, but it's all happening in that, say, house or Right. Whatever. You're not moving around a lot. You're lighting the space once. You're, right. It's very simple and cheap to make. Right. So you can shave time off of your production and save money. And maybe shoot it in six days instead of seven, or instead of nine days instead of ten. And every day is is a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. So depending on your show. In this case, the characters were only having one discussion, and there was no progression from scene to scene. It was uh -oh. just people <laughs> into the scene. And I've done that by accident before. <laughs> absolutely, we all have. Where you're like, you are just saying the same thing you said in the last scene, but louder. No, I'm not. I'm I'm saying yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm upset. Set, and now it's my turn to leave the room angry. Right. So there was a lot of that. And I love this show. So for me, watching it, I just felt nothing but, oh, sorry, man. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I'm sorry. This one didn't quite uh, come together. I know, I know what's happening here, I, and next week's going to be great, I'm sure. <laughs> sure exactly. <laughs> and I felt so bad for the writers. And uh, and all I can tell you right now, I immediately, even though I was tired, and this is a show that I don't like to watch tired, I watched another episode, kind of like as a sorbet, uh -huh. and it was right back to form. Stuff was happening. Characters were feeling things. It was it was beautiful. Well, you know, as, as a writer, you at least get to come out of it with hope because you know they saved that money for something really good. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> okay, let's get into this week's show. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is Jim. And this is Sam, and uh, Jeff, we're really, really happy to have you. So we were looking at your little cheat sheet, and I have a question. You moved out to L.A. two weeks after you graduated college? Yeah, I did. Two weeks to gather my things. About a week <laughs> to make sure, or sorry, uh, a week to make sure the car could handle the 1,400 miles. And, and, uh, and where did you, yeah, where, and I did it. where were you living? Dallas. So is being just out of college and in Dallas, you're broke. And I assume, I don't know, but I assume you're just that, that normal post-college semi-broke state um, or fully broke state. 
And then you thought, where could I go where I could be even more broke? <laughs> <laughs> I know, Los Angeles. I don't look back at it as a good idea. In fact, when people <laughs> ask me for uh, general advice about leaving for LA, I yeah. tell them uh, how much was in my bank account, and I say, that's not a good amount. <laughs> no, it's and not. And you should try to beat that. Um, I will tell you that I had more than you, because I, I already had a career. We, Jim and I owned restaurants first, and, and, and it still wasn't enough. No. <laughs> so now I will... Uh, so for everyone listening out there, I'll tell you my, I'd like to hear Jeff, what your reason is, but my reason for not coming out right away, especially now, it's very different than when we moved out here 21 years ago, but you don't need to be here to do anything while you don't have any chops yet. You can be in Dallas or St. Paul or, or Florida or wherever while you are taking all the online classes and listening to these podcasts like this and being in writers groups and taking writing classes in your state, which nowadays they have, which they did not 21 years ago because TV writing was not something that everyone thought they should do um, as much. And then you can be, you can just suck. You can pretty much suck anywhere. I think that's right. what the bottom line. Um, and instead we moved here and sucked for a number of years here. <laughs> in, a, in a very expensive place to suck. <laughs> right. When I got here and I was like, oh, we can get an apartment. Let's get an apartment for like 800 bucks, 1,000 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that was because uh, I was in you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and that's what they cost. Oh, well. <laughs> right. Um, so what about you? Why was it a terrible idea for you? Same thing or something different? You know, like I, I had said in the pre-interview, I was honestly – afraid that I would lose my nerve if I just didn't do it right away. I went to school for film, like you said, doing the online classes. I did all that. I sunk a bunch of money uh, into my education and the reasons I had uh, for not going when I had uh, a guest room available, the list wasn't long and it probably should have been a lot longer considering, <laughs> uh, like I said, monetarily, because the first year and a half, like you guys said, was incredibly difficult. That's that's brave, though. You yeah. have the courage of your convictions. You let yourself take the leap. And if you're not going to do it when you're right out of college, when are you going to do it? Well, we weren't right out of college. We just... I know, we, but we were it, just dumber. Well, because we thought we'd stored up enough, you know, nuts for the winter that, you know, as good squirrels, we would go out and we'd be well fed. And it turned out not to quite be that case. But Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's definitely a plus, to, you know, when you got nothing, you got nothing left to lose. Right. <laughs> you know, right. I mean... You know, if you, I don't know how much you had in a bank account, but if it was a few thousand bucks, well, that's not a lot. I mean, it's a lot more than not having a few thousand bucks, but <laughs> uh, Visa and uh, MasterCard would be happy to lend you money at a very reasonable rate. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then a year and a half in, you're facing a whole different level of yeah, problem. Yeah, you really are. Then you're living in your car. But, but yeah. so, okay, so you got out, out here, Jeff. What, what happened first? What, did something change there a year and a half in for you? It started out very promising. Within uh, 48 hours, I was on a set that wow. did not pay very well but it was a set uh, that I worked for a few days as a PA. And then after that, it just ran incredibly dry. I, I definitely feel like I moved out with reasonable expectations in that I, I knew a lot of people out here uh, who'd come out recently and I knew, uh, or I had an idea that the progression was be a PA, get people lunch, um, distribute copies and stuff like that. And so I didn't think, you know, I would be a writer straight away. I didn't think I'd be directing. I, I thought I had a grounded idea but I guess what I didn't understand is how many people I would be competing for to get lunch, to get coffee. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. It's amazing. It really is. And it, I think the, the biggest thing is how do you make yourself stand out for such, uh, for the bottom of the totem pole when your connections are a couple years older than you and they can suggest things, but they don't have hiring power, if you right, know what I'm saying. Right, right. I don't know that there is, and I know, you know, on Twitter, I've seen the threads where people go off on this kind of stuff, and maybe JR could speak to it because JR was on Carnival Row as, as support staff, and it was, you know, it's, because I've been on the other end of that when you're hiring it, and I've watched people and been participated in hiring support staff, and it is random. There is, and, and somebody who had the job on Tuesday, the person who's hiring them went home, had a thought and said, no, nah, I'm going to hire that other person. And they don't even know that happened. And it had nothing to do, uh, anything. anything important. It was like, you know, they had that one thing that I think might be useful. And then I know for a fact it did not, but I wasn't doing the hiring in that case. So it's very, you know, it's very random. And that, that's hard to deal with. That's that's Hollywood in general, and I think it starts with the assistant jobs and the and the PA jobs, and it's hard to deal with. I I would imagine. Yeah, I remember as a writer, you know, we always had the conversation of is it is it what's on the page 
You know, is it your skill? Is it luck? Or is it your connections? And and the reality is, it's all three. Yeah. Right. You have to have you have to have the skills so that when you make the connection, you can put something in front of people that is actually good. Mm-hmm. And then you have to be lucky enough to make those connections with people to put it in front of. Right? And 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 of course that doesn't apply to the PA or assistant thing because then the skills. What are the skills? How do you how do you walk right. in there and say I have incredible skills in getting coffee? Right. <laughs> there is no one that I know every lunch spot, although JR actually was really J- good. JR raised the bar. For he did. That. He was like, let's, let's, <laughs> let's eat at this place. It's uh it's 400 miles away. I'm going to leave now. I'll be back here by, but it's incredible. I heard it, the, it helped that he had the biggest lunch budget ever in the history of television. <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> we, 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 looked, we looked in that, but we feel your pain, man. And I want you to know, uh, whatever luck we have had, none of it showed up for the first few years. <laughs> yeah. And it was it was pretty grim. It, it wasn't just us; it was the industry, and then we were. But it was it was rough. And we are sitting right now recording the show, looking at my beautiful view out of my nice house. And every single blankety blank day that I am out here, I remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I appreciate yeah. it so much. And I said to my wife, I always say to my wife, uh, you know, it's that struggle was good because now I appreciate everything. And then she completely pops the balloon, and she's like, "Ah, you would appreciate it either way, <laughs> <laughs> or or you don't appreciate it enough anyway." So, <laughs> so sure. all right, so let's let's uh, let's talk about your idea. So, have you first of all, have you written scripts before? Uh, I'm on draft seven of this one. I mean, before this, I'm sorry, before this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, my that the only career aspiration I've ever had is screenwriting. Okay, wow. Okay. Which means true believer which means stuff, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It's right. a both, both. It's it's a both. All right, so seven drafts on this one. So let's let's talk about the log line, and then um, I'm going to ask you character names when we get there because it'll be easier. We'll, we're going to use those. We can discuss it. There. A drift young woman uh, starts to skim credit cards to afford a new life with hashtag van life. So okay. All right. So obviously van life, very uh, with Nomad Land doing so well at the Oscars. That's it, you know that's big. And Jim and I actually did a bunch of research on van life a few years ago for, for something we work in, a, a pilot yeah. we sold to FX. So uh, we're really into this idea. Okay. And I, like, yeah. I, I, I like that your protagonist has, uh, what's her name? Nicole. Nicole. I like that Nicole has like a realistic goal, like buying a van. I'm going to skim enough <laughs> credit cards to buy a van so I can go pursue like this very modest dream. Yeah. Is great. Like that feels of the right size. Now you're thinking fe- right. feature for this or uh, no, this is an hour pilot, right? So the big question is why does she want to do this? Why does Nicole need to van? Why does she want to be in van life? In some way, similar to my story, she had this idea of, I want to work in entertainment. I want to, uh, basically her goal was, I want to find a way to be famous. Um, and so what she did is she moved out to LA and realized that being famous is incredibly difficult. She got caught in sort of the assistant mafia out here and realized that it's long hours and it's grueling work. And sometimes it's a little bit abusive and, you know, without a real goal of like being an actor, being a writer, being a director, being a producer, it wasn't worth that to her. And so what she has decided now is maybe like Peter in office space, people weren't meant for cubicles and answering phones and writing emails and shit like that. And what she wants is the freedom she thinks that she has never had. Um, And maybe as you watch it, you realize it's a bit of a skewed idea of being uh, contained or subdued, but that's what she is after. She is after this sort of pure idea of freedom, of being on her own, of no Mm -hmm. boss, Mm -hmm. of what she sees, uh, you know, a big part of this is what she sees on social media is these people like you guys researched in van life. What is that glamorous idea of van life that you're constantly traveling? You're constantly meeting new people. Uh, everything's beautiful. Uh, as long as you have the DIY spirit, you can, you can sort of make this nomad life come true. And that is what, that's what she's grasping for. And the, t- the tangible uh, part of that is the van, the intangible, uh, like I said, is this idea of freedom. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting idea for a show. I think in this particular post-pandemic world where we're, you know, sort of all, everyone's been cooped up for a long time, I think it's a sort of aspirational goal that, that people could relate to. Two questions. What are you calling about about your story, that it's a roadblock for you? Actually, let me let me jump in and ask you a different question uh, that I need okay. to know before we get to that. Is this a show okay. about a grifter trying to get money to buy a van and da-da-da? Or is this a woman, is she a show about a woman who gets to van life? Uh, that's a good question. Yep. 
Okay, the show is about her getting to van life. The pilot episode is her getting enough money just to get the van. The first season I picture uh, is her, you know, it takes time, as you guys found, it takes time to build this van to make it workable and usable. And one of the big obstacles, uh, the thing that happens at the very end of the pilot, she gets a message on social media that has a picture of her skimming credit cards. And this guy wants, uh, this guy wants money or she, or this guy's going to end it. And the ultimate end of freedom would be prison. Great. All right, that's cool. I get totally get that. And what I like about that is she gets the van or almost gets the van, but then in the act, in the process of getting the van, she has screwed herself in some way. So this is all yes. about the struggle. It's the struggle to get to freedom. And, and just cut between the two poles, which is great. Freedom or prison. Right. That's great. That's what you're saying, right? Right, Jeff? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So the question, my number one question is, even before we get to the roadblock is, why does Nicole want that kind of freedom? Why does she think that's the place? And then why is her answer to skim cards? Because that's not a common answer to it. Or maybe it is. I don't really know. But not why? for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm reluctant to give you my credit card number, I, I must say. Yeah, nor, normally he just gives it out if you ask him. It's, right. Mm -hmm. The end of the call. Right. Okay, so why does she want this? Uh, growing up, she had parents that uh, married very young uh, and divorced when it didn't work. And she spent time bouncing between the two of them and was constantly uh, under their thumb and their uh, expectations. And uh, finally getting to college. College was a sort of, you know, freedom for her to step out, but it was also uh, being broke. Uh, she had, you know, one parent paying for it and didn't, you know, never quite achieving, uh, again, the skewed idea that the media or social media sells you of what it can be. There's always uh, this caveat. And if she can just work a little bit harder and get a little bit more money, tear the reins off a little bit more, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rabbit hole. It's something you can't quite grasp. And that's why I want to start at the beginning of her story uh, with her being young, still reaching for it and not having found out yet that it is illusory. But the thing, yeah, I get that. The thing about that she wants the freedom, you're never going to get to it on the show. This isn't a van life show, right? This is a So she will eventually, eventually she will handle the problem uh, with this guy that's extorting her. Uh, she will narrowly escape the authorities and get on the road. But, you know, again, like you guys found in your research, a lot of van life is not how it's portrayed. It's still a struggle after that. And, uh, you know, to still keep making money, she is still skimming credit cards. She's still going to gas stations. Uh, she's still putting herself at risk mm -hmm. um, to keep the life going. Right. Okay. So you're on draft seven. So I get that idea that wherever you go, there you are. Right. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah. Right. So, right. and, uh, and you know, when you, when she's working in an Amazon fulfillment center and, and just to make enough money to get gas and fix the car and go on, that's, that's an opportunity for more of her. Right. And you could do that. You could be like, well, this season is here and this season she manages to get there. You, there's a lot of variations on that. And I think that's cool. Uh, you, you've totally right. thought about it. But I'm going to write down what I think your roadblock is. And then Jim, I want you to think about what the roadblock is and let's see if we can get it close. So, okay. all right. So what's your roadblock? Now, is this a roadblock for my character or the roadblock for me as in why I'm, you know, one of... You as a writer. I think uh, two things. Um, I think the climax of her getting the van just on the page is not this great moment that I want it to be. And then the other thing, I've gotten notes on the script that are, it feels like I haven't gone deep enough into my character. And whether I have or not is not the point. It's not reflected. Um, right, right. Those, those are two things I want to resolve. All right. So I guess the second one. That was an easy one. I, I'm not taking any credit for that. <laughs> it's almost always the answer. It's almost, <laughs> we get that note, you know, what everyone right. does. Is your problem words? <laughs> right. That's, 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 that's how I feel that is. That is it. So I took the easy one. Here's why. Here's why. First of yeah. all, that idea of the climax of getting the van is not, as you said, it's not a great moment. That is the least of your problems. Yeah. Totally Absolutely, hundred percent. Let if, that go. If, if that's the end of your pilot, if you tie her getting the van to the exposure of someone has the goods on her skimming credit cards, right? That's a great one-two punch. It's a fine kind of pilot ending. She's achieved her dream. Uh oh, she's also kneecapped at the same time. Right. Great. Great. Now I will I will tell you that what you said is exactly the same kinds of notes that we have both given and received in the last oh month or two. Okay. <laughs> Did you say day? Which is yeah yeah. Which is this? 
it's there, but nobody can see it, or it's just under the surface, or it's not clear enough, it's not right. obvious enough, whatever that is. Right. And that is, Got it. and I literally gave that note yesterday. All right. I read a friend of mine, uh, of ours, Dan, he wrote a, a beautiful play, and he I'd read part one, it got produced, it, won, it, it, it did very well at Fringe great Festival, play. great play, and he wrote part two, and my big note was, let's, you know, let's go deeper with the characters, and we got very specific, and it was a great conversation, and I love, that's, that's what gets us out of bed, it's really fun. But really, a lot of the stuff I was saying, he would kept saying, well, that is my intention in that scene. And I was like, great, I'm the fresh eyes, and I'm telling you, I don't see it. Right, it didn't come through. It right. didn't land. And this is the thing where I honestly think that writer notes from other writers a lot of times are, especially writer notes of people who have written a lot. Um, so they've screwed up a lot. <laughs> they've gone down the blind alleys. <laughs> they've right. completely. Oh, you know, I've made that mistake eleven times before. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens next. <laughs> I mean, I really think that's why senior writers. It's not the talent that the, you know. Some people are like, oh, I can see right. It's just I have bashed my head against that. Yeah. More times than you have, and sometimes successfully broken through, and other times just concussed myself and then put the script down and moved on to something else. Nice. So, yeah, thank nice you. Metaphor. All right. So, I, I, sorry, Jeff, we probably lost you for a minute. But here's the point. What you don't have yet is obviously the character. And the character, it, the point is, I don't know why she wants to run away. When I asked you that question, it was about her fear of being uh, bored or boring or her not fitting Such into. being trapped or. Yeah. But that's hard to write. Right, that's very right. loose and non-specific. Right, that's that's sort of the background emotion about how she feels about specific events in her life that have made her feel that way, and what are those specific right. events? Well, what what are the things she's carrying in her heart? What are the scars that are making her feel trapped and as if running away is might be the better answer? Right, got it. And, and what do you think about that, Jeff? I'm gonna I I want to keep going, but I want to ask you, what do you think about that? I mean, I can tell you right now that uh, what I gave you about the the parents being divorced and feeling under their thumb, it's it's an answer, but it's not the answer. It's not, even if it were on the page, that doesn't feel strong enough. It feels like that happens to half of the globe and, right. and right. only, only, you know, a quarter of the globe is stealing credit cards. So it just, the numbers don't match. <laughs> That's right. Well, and to ask a slightly different question as we discuss this, Jeff, you know, one thing it, we're, we've talked about a bunch of stuff here. So far we have one character and, you know, all of this at some level comes back to how do we get it out? Who is he? Who is she interacting with that gets these truths about herself out onto the page in a way that we can experience them? Right. So she's got a she has a friend who is one of these like Instagram model, social media influencers and sort of a trope that I work into a lot of things that I write is that my characters meet the person that they want to be yeah. uh, at some time in their story. And it's either a disappointment or it furthers their dream. It just says, you know, come with me a little further. This could be great. Yeah, that's and good. so that that's who her friend is. And then she has she has this guy that she's hooking up with, uh, who is, you know, this idea of freedom can't be tied down to afraid of commitment, can't be tied down to him. Uh, and how she ends up getting the van is she steps over a line and she steals a credit card of someone that she knows uh, and sells that to get the last bit of money to be able to bring to to get the van by the end of the pilot. Yeah, that still feels vague to me though. And I'll right. tell you how I'll tell you, and that that's maybe part of the brick wall that you're running into. Um, right. You know, sometimes the note we give is to be a little dumber, and uh, but really it's just simpler. Just be simpler. And the idea is, you're saying she's skimming credit cards, and I'm like, well, okay, could you? Could she be doing other little acts of larceny as well? Does she get close to people and then take their stuff? Because I'm kind of interested in people who steal from their friends or steal from people they know, right? I'm kind of right. interested in uh, how they how they line that up. You know, is she working everybody all the time or is she never? I mean, what the idea well, of skimming credit cards to me feels bloodless. So I'm really interested when you said um, she steals from someone that she knows. And I'm like, well... What you know, and it's the sense of pressure on her that leads her to that choice, right? Because we have to, for a protagonist, at some level, we have to like her or at least appreciate her, enjoy who she is, even if we kind of don't like her. You know, that can happen. But like, we we have to feel for the pressure that's on her that's making her go do this at some point here in the pilot in order to get behind her. Mm -hmm. Sure. So. First of all, it would be great, and it's, it's you know you have a great moment where she steals from someone that she knows, but. Why save that to the end? Why not do that early? And then I'll start to understand her a little bit if that's her central dilemma, you know? What, what, and you're going to say, well, I want her to build to it, but I'm going to say to you. Right, uh, right, right, right. You don't, you don't, you're not going to have me on page 50 
if you don't have me on page five. Right. So a uh, caveat or, or answer-ish to that is big moment before that happens that puts her under the gun to do that, to I need that card now, is she gets quasi-caught in the act a few pages earlier. So now she is on the nightly news. There, there, there is you know vague footage of her on the nightly, nightly news. There are people looking for her. She needs, at this moment, to get this, to probably get rid of her old vehicle, get this van, and get the fuck out of L.A., ASAP. Yeah, that's, but again, that's you know, good. That, that's still, that's a logistical thing, but is that like an emotional push or drive or I wonder, is that the thing I'm looking for? Well, that's, that's an external problem is the problem there. Yeah, I guess. Right, I, right. I, I guess listening to this, Jeff, what I'm thinking about is the, is that internal thing where, where for example, and I, I don't know what's actually in your story, but if, if she's all in, she's got this friend who's an Instagram, you know, model influencer, whatever person, and she's all in, yeah. she's devoted to that idea. That's what she wants. And her friend moves up the level and she doesn't. She mm-hmm. gets shat on in some way that, that it's just clear that that door is just slammed in her face. But she's right. already made some commitments. She's got some, you know, whatever. Right. And she has this wild hair idea that, well, but maybe if I'm an influencer living the van life, like I could document that and be famous. Or, I don't know, whatever it is, like some yeah, some yeah. some aspiration. We, we see the wound. We see what she wants next. But the only way she can get there that she can think of, she conveniently steals a credit card number and it works in the very beginning, in the very beginning. Yeah. Right. And that gives her the like, oh, shit. This is maybe this is how I do this. Right. Yeah. And so we can kind of be with her because, you know, we can we, we were with her when she was just an honest woman trying to find her way to make a splash in the world. And then that's torn out from underneath her. And now she sees this other way. And even though it's wrong, we're kind of with her because she's just trying to patch this hole in her life. That we and, she, her and she doesn't want to steal that money. But, right. But she doesn't have another opportunity to do it. Right. And, and then she way, can't can't resist it because it's easy. And she's sliding down a slope that we can all kind of understand. And and I want to be sure, clear. Sure. We know we know you you have seven drafts of this, and we we already right. haven't read it, and we don't want to blow it up. So these are all this is just illustrative, right? This is the idea of we want to see the the original sin, and we want to see what drove her there. You don't have to. Sometimes a lot of shows deal with that in a flashback, or they they deal with it one character telling another one a little later, uh, and you can come in hot where she's stealing the card and that's your amazing first scene where she steals it and then and then you find out why she was driven to that point right but it's just setting emotional hooks so that we're we're with her in some way we we feel the experience yeah it can't just be you know some sort of angst that thing and and you know i I need to understand more than that um otherwise right right and and it's not because that's not true or real it's just not enough to drive for me sure sure Um, Cause, and I need to like her. I don't want her to be an influencer or anything like that because I, I, I want to be like, oh, you know, I get the idea of wanting freedom and aspiring to this thing, which may not be cool, by the way, when you actually get there. But I get wanting to be that. And so that will give me the buy-in with her. But unfortunately, she's picked the wrong way to do it, and she's spiraling and spiraling. And I'm like, don't do it, don't do it. Oh, damn, she did it. <laughs> and then, okay, right, now right. get out of here. Now get out of here. Now take the van. Oh, the van doesn't work. It needs more money. Okay, so she goes to get more money, and that creates a problem. And then – Things start escalating. It's all because of this original sin, and I am in. Right, it's a spiral. Um, and and she's yeah, got. Bit- it, it sounds like a, a an Enmedius Ray thing. Like figure, you know, you always want to come into the middle of things, but the middle of things could be a different starting point for everybody. And it sounds like for me, you know, it's a better idea to move my starting point maybe a little bit further back or change her circumstances slightly uh, from that starting point. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, there's so many ways to go with it, and I don't want to be prescriptive with plot, but another version is, and this is the terrible version, <laughs> so don't judge uh-huh. the moment too much, but I'm saying you said she's getting coffee and so and she gets a job and she's going to make, you know, as production assistants make $150 for the day. Holy crap. After taxes, this and that, that doesn't pay for shit. And we know that. And, uh, and then she gets shit on by somebody at work, whether it's her immediate superior or it's the big star and that's it. She's had it. That's her. I had it moment. That's when she sees the picture of the van and she decides that's what she gets. So that's the inciting incident before. Or it's can I, the Can I ask can I yeah. ask a question about that one real quick? I feel like it's a it's a prescient question and maybe I should have the answer from working in the industry uh, for long enough. You know, in the very beginning, uh, that was something I had and I it, God's honest, I stopped and I got rid of that because I thought that's not going to be read well by someone who's made it in the industry is that a lowly assistant is complaining about being crapped on by their superiors. That feels like the <laughs> trash pile. 
<laughs> is that, <laughs> am I being ridiculous? Is that a realistic concern? Um, Pretty much everybody who's made it in the business has been the assistant who's been crapped on by their boss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's... A- so, so, they, so, so they will say this is, this is relevant and this is not first world problems and... No, it's because it's her they, job and it's humiliation. Yeah. She's got to make money. And when yeah, she looks at a check the- and it's $122 for the day and, me, and then she goes and fills up her tank for $37, you're like... This is not sustainable. I mean, right, right. the other thing is, and this is true not just for Hollywood, from everywhere, no one ever thinks they're the bad guy. So there are people that uh, are in our industry who right now, post Weinstein, post Scott Rubin, you know, re- Rudin le- recently, post, post all the, the monsters yeah. who are carrying on in a way that they do not believe they are the bad guy. And that will change. They're, they will They will be called out soon or they'll get away with it (laughs) either way but either way is your point is they would never recognize themselves in that story absolutely not got it Uh, absolutely everyone's the hero of their own story right 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 half of america doesn't think they're racist (laughs) right (laughs) you know i mean that's that's not that's impossible you know and 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 the flip side of it is like it's all about the specificity of events happening to your character and as Mm -hmm. long as it's true and has emotional repercussions for your character the details you can set it wherever you want to and if you happen to set it in hollywood if it feels emotionally true in the script no one cares Right, that oh, it's inside the business, but whatever. I don't. I'm following the track of this woman, and and her overall story is not sort of within Hollywood. So you know, if there's any ding there, that goes away pretty quickly anyway. If anything, gotcha. if anything, that I I would say that that world, that tableau, I feel like I've seen that. Yeah. Right. If you put it at a shoe store, and this is a guy who owns three shoe stores, and he thinks he's this, he's he thinks he's the Jeff, the Jeff Bezos of of yeah. shoe stores, which I think Jeff Bezos is actually the Jeff Bezos of shoe stores. <laughs> 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 Ever since he bought Zappos, yeah, geez. exactly. Yeah. But, but I, uh, but I mean, if he thinks he's a, yeah, you know, that's funnier in a way and sadder at the same time, right? And it's those right, small right. shifts that make that that reveal your voice. And not to step on that point because that's an excellent point. But having this this discussion of the last few minutes makes me wonder in sort of the core construction of your character, you've got a young woman who, on the one hand, craves fame. For some reason that feels sort of nebulous, and at some level that's okay with me because not everyone understands why they're driven to do things. But she's got a hunger right. for fame, but then her next response is to go seek the freedom and sort of anonymity of being loose on the road and not even having an address. And those two things feel right. in conflict in what could be a good way, but I don't quite understand. Like, I sort of want to see the tension come into play for her between those two things. If, if she's going to run away from being super well-known in the world to being an anonymous person living on the back roads, like, that's a big change, and, and that feels like there should be a, a big emotional hit that I'm, I'm at least getting glimpses of in the pilot for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I want it to be that contradiction of, I want to be this famous person, I want this, you know, I want to be on screen, I want all of this. However, my way to get there means that I must maintain anonymity. And, you know, like you said, I just got to find a way to create the right tension between those two things to make it interesting. Well, I think once you once we know what she wants and why she wants it, I think you just start just throwing rocks at her. And, it's, right. it, and then it's not the rock. That's the thing that I want to say. It's not the rock that is the important it's thing. It. Yeah, it's her reaction to it and what she does with that information, right. uh, does with that thing. So if she gets called out on the news, what does she do? Well, for example, she runs back to the woman or friend, man or woman, that she stole from, who knows she stole from them, and says, I have no place else to go. And then I have a, and I'm just being illustrative here, but, but I'm just saying, now it's like you put her into the worst place you can, which is she right. has to go face one of the people she wronged. And maybe they throw her out on the street, but at least I get to her see her do it. I get to see her make her case. And then the other person's reaction is less important unless they're a recurring character. But that's the kind of thing I would be looking for. Like not, oh, my God, she's on the news or, oh, my God, she needs money now. But what does she do with it? What, what, what does she do because of that? Right. And same thing with her friend who is a successful Instagram person. I mean, it almost feels I sort of naturally have that sense of her kind of some amount of jealousy and, and yes. it could, could be yes. aspiration. Like, but it feels like there's tension there. Like, does she, you know, adore that other person? That person is the one who exposes her or that she steals from or that who shoots her down from getting her big gig or that opens the door. But then she can't take advantage of opening that door because suddenly she's been on the news and has to run out of L.A. and, and misses her big shot at 
at becoming a, a an influencer for a minute, right? For, right. You know, whatever. Those there, there's multiple ways to go there, but I, I want to see some dynamic between the two of them too that exposes these these drives inside her Nicole. Yeah, I tried to to build that into it in that she is constantly, you know, her looking to her for you know inspiration or advice or whatever is also tinged with like you said envy, uh, yeah. jealousy to the point where she's mimicking and copying her, you know, it's, it's clearly an un- unhealthy thing. Or uh-huh. hopefully, clearly. Clearly it was a problem. <laughs> right. Clearly it was a problem. Have you ever done yeah. the uh, Have you ever done the on-the-nose version where you just had everyone say everything that you want them to say in a completely terrible way? Have you done uh, that? I know you say suck, but I, I, I can't suck like that. That's like, you know, what? going out and trying to get COVID. You know, I, I can't do that. That's too much. Yeah, it's hard. It, it's definitely hard. <laughs> but, Jeff, you got to do that. Right. I, I, it's illustrative. Yeah. Did you, did someone say they'd give us 10 bucks every time we say illustrative on this show? Cause I feel like we no. are, that's been the word of the day, <laughs> but it, you know, when you sit there and you write a scene and, uh, and you just write, ex- everyone says exactly what's on their mind. Don't think of it as your first draft. Think of it as your first, your outline with words. Right. And I, I, that actually helps a lot. I've done it a bunch of times because I, I more tended in the school of don't say it. The elliptical. Yeah. In the old, in the old days. But, and I've worked with a lot of people I've worked with showrunners and others definitely prefer you not to just say it. So we're all on the same team. And in the end, we almost always end up just saying it. It's true. Not necessarily, not hopefully not in a shitty way. I'm not saying everyone's going to come in and say, I am so upset because this is what happened in the last scene. It's not that. But if you're if you find that you are really worried about saying it too clearly, it's almost sure to me for if I do that that I'm not really saying it at all. <laughs> you know, right. and I need to err on the side of more clarity because that is the the note and we were on a show uh, called Crisis on NBC a while back now, I don't know, 6 7 years, but but there was a point where we were try- it was a very complicated show, FBI, CIA, uh, Gillian Anderson, Dermot Mulroney, really smart writers on that show. Um, but we ended up, I ended up on the Clarity Commission, uh, I dubbed it, which was just a few writers of us sitting there and sorting out what we knew and when we knew it. And this was less yeah. ab- less about the characters, a part of it, but it was about, it was about the characters, but it wasn't, it was a network show. It wasn't a, you know, deep dive looking at my navel, uh, um, slow streamer. And it was it was huge for me because that I would normally not have volunteered myself for that job. But you well, did a great job of it. Thanks, and I, I did. I learned a lot while I was doing it because I was really forced to say, this is what the character believes at this point, and this is how I know that. This is what I saw. And I just went down that for multiple episodes for something for some reason that we had at that time, just so we wanted to lay it all out because we were getting banged every which way. And it really helped. Every scene I did it. And the piece that I'm recommending for you is not just asking what do they want in the scene and what's getting in the way, but actually have them say it. Or have another character say to them, I think what you want is this, right? Right. And then as you just hold your nose while you're doing it. Right. And then even if they <laughs> deny it, and they, right. Yeah. Just maybe, maybe have a beer. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe kick yourself in the nuts a couple of times. So you're distracted by the pain of that. And while you are distracted, just write it. And I'm telling you, it helps. It really helps. Uh, because you'll figure out a better way to say it. Yeah, I was going to say very, very intuitive. So credit to you because uh, this is a note that I've gotten back a lot too, is that in all of my attempts to bury exposition, to bury the lead, to never have them say exactly what they're thinking, uh, I've definitely gotten the note that I hide their intentions and their emotions too much. So I just want to say I deserve no credit for this because this is half of us do that. And the other half, you know, it's you, you, yeah. it's always the right line and we're always on one side or the other. Too much or a little, you know, is it, and by the way, I could write, I could read a scene. Jim could read a scene in a different script. In, you know, we're look, reading some other person's script and I will si- circle it and say, ah, that's too on the nose. And Jim will circle and say, great. <laughs> you know, that happens all the time. It's, this right. is, it's not an absolute. But if you're getting that note regularly, then I suspect that it's because you're, you're doing what I did, which was always try to find a really clever way to imply it, not look at it directly, all that stuff, which is good writing if it's done right. I just wasn't doing it right at the time. In, in almost any situation, even if you're like not looking at it, at some point in the scene, it sure helps if somebody sticks the label on what they're talking about. Yeah. Because otherwise, it, right. it will fall through the cracks and no one will know what it was that they were really thinking and doing. 
And, and I'll, I'll tell you from the experience of not just writing it, but then shooting it and working on scenes with actors, unless you are having a scene where the character comes and says, here are five lines of exposition so that you can catch up with the scene, which by the way is in a certain amount of television. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying yeah. this doesn't exist, but unless they're doing that, and usually it's in procedurals, a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, where it's hard and you're really recapping, you know, or the worst case scenario, which I did see on television, which was two cops who have worked together for years. One of them explaining Miranda to the other, the Miranda rights as they're walking up the courthouse steps. And I was like, wow, that, how did you, all I, you know, there's so many things you can think about. All I thought about was the poor writer who had to look at the uh, actor and say, I know, I know. Yeah, well, I got a note. I got and a the note. actor's like, it's okay, it's season 11. Do you know how much money I'm making? I'll su- just tell me what you want me to say. I'll say it. I, 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 hope, I hope they don't give up. But the point is, that stuff, unless it really is boring exposition, uh, meaning of the plot, actors don't have any problem right. with it. If someone comes in and says, I'm really upset because my mom just did this thing, they love that. Because they're upset. Yeah. They have something to play. Well, and, and even instead of them coming in upset and, and we're presumed to know what's in there, if they the actor is going to ask you, why am I upset? So they need to know too. And if it's clear right. in, the, in the dialogue, even though it'll sound expositive to you, it, it's not, it's, it's, they don't react that way. And if they're great, they're really good actors, which there are a lot of really good actors. They can, they'll, they'll make, you won't even notice it, the pipe when it comes out of their mouth, right? Because it's so full of emotion, and they're not going to say it the way you're hearing it in your head. Uh, by the way, Jeff is now going to write a, an engineering manual. <laughs> it's going to be, <laughs> hello, my name is Sam. Here is my need. I am feeling very stressed right now. <laughs> and then you're going to blame me. Are you going to betray me again? <laughs> yes, this is what I'm worried about, that you will betray me. And consequently, what, you're not going to betray me? You're, are you actually my friend? Hey, that's the scene turn. Okay, now I can go to the following scene. Um, by the way, that would not be a terrible thing to write for the outline with words or for the. You yeah, know. you know, it, it would be. <laughs> but you can do better than that. <laughs> But the- well, this, is, uh, this is great and terrifying. You know, it means that I actually have to change after the call. This wasn't ending with uh, <laughs> what, what part of me was hoping that it would end and say, well, listen, you're on the right track. This is perfect. Uh, things are things are changing for you. But uh, look what you've done now. Yeah. Well, I'm, our goal is not with this script because we haven't read the script. And so we don't know. Right. You were just. It you're, could you're, be genius, and we're just screwing you up. Yeah, it absolutely could be. But who knows? This, but this skill or this thing, which you know, as in all things, is you know, the, we know the rules or we know the tricks because we've done them. We're always learning new ones, but that doesn't mean we can do them on the day that we need to do it. Sometimes right. it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. And one of the benefits of Jim and I working together is, hopefully, one of us will remember that when we get to that scene or that moment right. or that idea. Um, and I'll say, I think our story engine's a little messed up. And, and then he'll, usually he'll say, really, why? Um, and then we'll get into it and that'll be three hours. But the point is, it helps to have fresh eyes. With my friend Dan's play, and this is what other writers can do for you, is I could say, I think these characters are in this way. And he says, I, I don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. And he says, well, I think it's pretty clear to me in these scenes, but if Sam's not seeing it, then I need to make it clear. Um, and just sure. so you know, our agent did exactly that on our last draft, a few, few drafts on the script that Jim and I are writing right now. And right. so these notes don't change. It's just, we know where we're aiming for, <laughs> but getting there. Oh my God. Sure. Sometimes, you know, look, I, I wish, um, I wish there was like a, a set of things there just isn't a set of things. It's just the toolbox. And it's not one of those really well-organized Ace Hardware things where everything goes in the right pocket. It's just a big Ziploc. Yeah, there's, there's, I know writers who want there to be a recipe. If you just do, you know, you set out your list of 20 ingredients and then you put them together, it's going to be perfect guacamole when you're done. Mm-hmm. And no, that's really not how it works. No. So what we're saying is, yeah, this is how you should do it, but this, this is an aspirational goal for all of us. Right, right. Gotcha. Um, I will say, though, uh, when it is 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, and you're in a writer's room, and you just had dinner, and you're going into your food coma, and it, it doesn't really matter you know, what's going on, you must get that draft out tonight, or you must finish that outline, this is what saves you. Yeah, because it will at least, anyone can read it and go, oh, okay, I understand what the scene is, check, right. we can move on. Because you can always make it better. Right. But uh, but clear work, clear is great. <laughs> clear buys you a lot. At that lot. point, on the nose is not bad. Okay. Well, what you think is on the nose. That right. doesn't it may mean not it be is. to the next person. It right, may not right. be. And also, right. you know, look, the line is, look, I just want to go see my mother. 
can also be, dude, what the fuck is the matter with you? Of course I want to see my mother. She did da 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 And then it doesn't sound like exposition as much. That was terrible, by the way. But I just want to say, it, it doesn't have to be, I want to see my mother. It's, it can even be someone saying, I, why what, would I want to go see my mother? Why would I, I want I to see my her. mother? Blah, 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 yeah, blah. You could do that and then right. do the negative. There's so many ways to get that exposition out, but you must get it out. And, gotcha. and in your case, by the way, in terms of the roadblocks, if you can't get it out, it might be because you don't know. Right. Because that comes up too. Uh, is yeah, that right. you, you realize you're trying to write the on the nose thing and you don't know what they're saying. And if you cannot write the terrible on the nose line, that is a pretty damn good indication that you don't know what the hell you're saying. Right. And and that's a revelation that's worth having, right? Yeah. Like you figure out, oh, I've been faking my way through this scene. I thought there was a turn here. <laughs> Nothing's actually happening. Nothing's I don't know happening. what the character wants. Uh huh. So, uh, right. And it, so, what I, I guess what we're saying is the very thing that you're worried about is actually might have multiple repercussions, which is you're not, the process isn't letting you see that what you know and don't know. And then it's keeping it obscured, even if you do, from the audience. And so that, that bangs wrong t- two ways. You know, just in that, in right. that classic sense of um, you, you do a, a bad draft and you can keep improving it with drafts, getting that basic draft that's kind of bald and simple and plain, mm-hmm. um, if that, if that draft works, everything you do to spice it up is going to work too because you have the bones. The yep. scenes work. You know what the emotional flow of the story is. Well, then you can make it great because mm-hmm. you can start obscuring the shit out of stuff. And as long as you can still read the scene and find the thing, yeah, it's golden. You know, Jeff, do you write long outlines for your scripts? Yeah, they're pretty. Uh, they're pretty extensive. They <laughs> they start as bullet points, but they never stay as bullet points. They they all become uh, paragraphs with uh, you know a bullet point on the occasional page. Great. And what I was going to say is, I don't like long on- outlines, but there are a lot of people that really do. And I think maybe I'm starting to understand that now because in an outline you don't have to be good. Outlines are all terrible. They're hard to read. Yeah. They're not in all the fun stuff is not in there. There's the it's just a description of it's like describing sex they're, they're completely <laughs> you know, between two instead stools of having it, right yeah. Yeah. it's There's not a value it's not in a bull- that somewhere too and and the thing about the outline is right the out the thing that the outline might help you with if you wrote it longer is you would feel free you can write bad dialogue and there are some people that write what they call uh, scrout lines which are you know right. screenplay outlines and they're 20 25 pages i've heard of shows doing this and they do it because it reveals it, the breaks it reveals everything yeah. Right. I would much rather just write a, a lame draft uh, than write a 25 page uh, scrout line. But, you know, they obviously work for people. And if I end, and if Jim and I end up on a show or that's what the showrunner wants, then we'll, we'll write that. I, I have found myself a lot recently uh, on the last show we were working on in particular. I would sit there and have an outline or a scene I knew wasn't working or whatever. And I would sit there and just on a pad of paper, I would just start running dialogue out between the two characters to figure out, oh, if they say this or this is their idea and this idea and this idea, just to get an order of argument. What what are the things they're talking about to each other that gets me through the scene and mm-hmm. gets to the point? Yeah. And once you kind of understand where they're each coming back and forth from, well, then you can dress it up and say whatever you want to say. Yeah, you can rewrite it and you just have that version. And you'll know framework. It. Yeah, it's not just swapping out words, by the way. It'll be more than that. I don't want yeah. to say that you're not taking the terrible line and just putting in a good one. It's not that. It's a step along the way, though. So you are 100% sure of what the hell's happening in the scene. And I think when you rewrite it, sometimes you find different ways to do it. Yeah. Got it. How much do we mess you up now? <laughs> How, uh, no, do we screw up the script it, it totally? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but that's the point. That's the fucking point. It's got to be, uh, you know, you, you. this wasn't a, if I called you guys up to move a few commas, then I'd waste your time. This is uh We do like moving commas. I mean, I, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. it kills some time, and then at the end of it, you can say, I, I think I did something. You can lie to yourself. Yeah. No, you probably did do something. Um, I, you know, I, I want to say, Jeff, too, like, for, because after all this critique, like I thought the, the basic pitch of your story is great. Yeah. Like I, this is really good. And it's funny because I leaned into the van life part of it because I, it's funny. We were talking about another show our, our show Haven we did and how well it worked because we were only in two days out of seven. We shot five out, two in. That means Be- uh, we were not on the sound stages for, for two days. I was getting oh, sorry, that. Yeah. The, the point being that it, the show looked really good and it had this organic living feel because we were always out in the real world rather than on the sound stages right and gotcha. that van life show like it's very producible in a sense because you got a van and you got a person <laughs> and they have their problems and it's it's not it may not be uh, that old tv series kung fu where they wander town to town through episodes <laughs> right. but um 
But but it could be in a sense, right? You can go from community to community. You could move through seasons to different places depending on on how this person's problems evolve, um, what they need, whether she remains sort of an outlaw. Like I don't know what what her story is going to be, but it's a very interesting thing. And I think in the the current environment in Hollywood of what people are interested in hearing and and reading and seeing, this this is a very interesting place to be working. But but wait a minute though, he just said I love your idea, just not the one you're actually writing. <laughs> well, no, but he was saying no, but he was saying she gets the van in like season two, right? She season gets on the road, two, yeah, season right? two. So I mean, Se- season two is all uh, cruising in the van and finding out uh, yeah. life continues to suck and that it uh, never gets better. It's a very important. Right. It's an important show that I I need to get the message out about is that there is no hope. <laughs> Well, what what I was saying, it's funny because when you were pitching that, I was thinking, yeah, except, okay, so for season one, you got to build all these sets, but then you're going to throw away all those amortized sets and just be on the road. You might wind up having to pick one or the other sort of from a production standpoint, but that's a million years in the future. Yeah, that's a million. You still have to do the First, pilot. let's get a great script and get him right. a job. <laughs> that's our that's right. our goal. Get him a, get Jeff a job. Um, I think that should be the title of the podcast. Actually, get Jeff a job, or just insert name of of writer that we're talking to. How to best do that? Yeah, sure, sure. Jeff, thank you so much for calling yes. us, man. It's been a real pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you for your time. No, thank you both pleasure. of you. Yeah, good luck, man. Thanks a lot. And that's all we've got for you this week. Our producer, J.R. Zamora Thal, is working the mixing board. Our logo was designed by Julianne de Bar Montclair, and our music was provided by Budarays out of Austin, Texas. If you want to get in touch, we are at The Salmon Gym on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook and YouTube as The Writer's Room with Sam and Jim. And if you like hanging out in the room with us, give us a follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend, would you, so we can get JR paid. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>